Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Randy Hollerith and I am the Dean of the Washington National Cathedral and it is an honor and a pleasure to have you here with us and to begin the first of a series of conversations that we hope will be a blessing to many. Our goal for this evening is to create a space in which we can begin to have some conversation about the Lee Jackson windows here in the cathedral and the larger issues of race and the legacy of slavery in our nation. If you do not know the recent history of events regarding these windows, I invite you to read about that history in the information we provided for you within your program, in your program for tonight's conversation. Tonight, please know, is the first in an ongoing series of conversations over the next two years intended to foster conversation and a deeper understanding. While the leadership of the cathedral made the decision to remove the Confederate battle flags from these windows, the larger question of whether the window should stay in the sanctuary or be moved to a different location was intentionally left open for a period of two years so that we might engage in conversation and education around the difficult issues of race in our history and in our present life together. As I said in my letter that is part of your program, yes, these windows are about our history, but they are also about our future. How will we move forward together? How will we learn from one another? How can we use the windows to write a new narrative of our history together? The conversation we're having tonight and the ones we will have over the next two years are part of a much larger conversation that is taking place nationally, an important conversation around race and the legacy of slavery. As a cathedral community, we are hoping to create a place within this sacred space where we can listen and learn from one another with open hearts and minds. We hope to model the love of our Lord Jesus Christ that seeks always to reconcile all that is broken in ourselves, in our community, and in our culture. These conversations may well be uncomfortable at times. They involve difficult subjects but they are important conversation and it is our hope that over the course of the next several years with God's help we can create something that is positive and uplifting for us all. We are so grateful for your presence and we invite your participation not only in this program but in future conversations. If you would like to share your ideas about the nature of some of those future conversations and if you'd like to share with us in this journey, I invite you to look at the back page of your program where there is a link where you can go and sign on to be part of this journey together. So welcome, we're glad that you're here. And if you'll permit me, I'd like to start with a prayer this evening. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant, O oh God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart that the barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatreds cease, that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let's begin. I will not repeat their bios because you have them in front of you, but it is my great pleasure to welcome our participants, Dr. John Kosky, the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, Dr. Rex Harris, and our moderator, Ray Suarez. Please join me in welcoming them. <laughs> yeah. I think there was a misprint in one of the earlier. Thanks, Dean, and welcome to Monuments Speak. Thanks for coming. Thanks to the panel, and thanks for being willing, both audience and panel, to wrestle with some of the questions that arise in a people, any people, when they have to face their own past, 
and what the past tells them today. We're here this evening because symbols speak. We're surrounded by them. Red and green traffic lights, elephants and donkeys, Gothic towers, the cross, the lamb. Saints are all around this building. They stand mutely and mostly unlabeled in statuary, paint or stained glass. They identify themselves through a language understood by the artist and by the viewer. St. Philip with an arm full of stones, St. Peter with his crossed keys, Sebastian shot through with arrows, Lucia with a platter and two eyeballs. They work as a language in part because of widely shared understanding, a consensus about what they mean. The red hexagon of a stop sign doesn't have parties chiming in to register their objections or insist it doesn't mean stop at all, but in fact, it means speed up. Symbols have meaning, symbols speak. They derive their power from common understanding, except when they don't. Can they change over time? Can they be repurposed over time? Can they have layers of meaning that come from context? Who displays them? Who witnesses their display? And can common understandings render some symbols hard to use? Can the passage of time add meanings that leave us very clear on the fact that symbols speak while some of us wish they just shut up? Today we come together in this cathedral church to discuss the display of windows dedicated while this church was still under construction to memorialize Generals Robert E. Lee and Thomas Stonewall Jackson. As we're gathered here, not in front of the memorials which are over there by President Wilson, let me tell you what Lee's inscription says. To the glory of God, all righteous and all merciful, and an undying tribute to the life and witness of Robert Edward Lee, servant of God, leader of men, general in chief of the armies of the Confederate States, whose compelling sense of duty, serene faith and unfailing courtesy mark him for all ages as a Christian soldier without fear and without reproach. The Lee windows show the general as a soldier educator and engineer. Stonewall Jackson is shown kneeling prayerfully in camp while a bugler plays and he reads the Bible. And he's shown in an adjacent window as an armored crusader, arms uplifted while heavenly trumpets play, going to glory. His memorial reads in part, like a stone wall in his steadfastness, swift as lightning, and mighty in battle, he walked humbly before his creator, whose word was his guide. This bay is erected by the United Daughters of the Confederacy and his admirers from south and north. For the moment, the Confederate battle flags have been removed from the Lee and Jackson windows and replaced with rectangular pieces of colored glass. The bays, the windows, they remain can their meanings change over time? Can what is appropriate or acceptable change over time? How has time shaped Americans' understanding of the Civil War and the real life flesh and blood men, the actual Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson? Do they belong in a church? In the windows throughout this building, you'll find prophets, apostles, martyrs, saints ancient and modern, Yes, and you'll find political leaders, two of them right by the front door, Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. What does it mean for them to be depicted in a house of prayer for all people? And what the designer of the city, Pierre L'Enfant, called a great church for national purposes. Joining me in this conversation, from left to right, Dr. John Kosky, historian at the American Civil War Museum, and author of The Confederal, Confederate Battle Flag, America's Most Embattled Emblem. 
Sitting next to Dr. Kosky, the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, canon theologian here at Washington National Cathedral. And sitting here directly next to me, Dr. Rex Ellis, Associate Director of Curatorial Affairs at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, recently opened here in Washington. Dr. Kosky, I want to start with you. I want you to take us back to the period when these windows were being imagined, designed, and installed. It was a time when Americans were preparing to look back uh, as the, the centennial of the Civil War approached. We were uh, experiencing the Dixiecrat candidacy of Strom Thurmond for president in 1948. Um, the departure of the final and oldest Confederate veterans, so there were actually no first-hand uh, witnesses to the war. They were leaving the stage, so it was, it was sort of a secondary memory uh, passed down through people uh, rather than an experience spoken of firsthand. Where were we at as a country and in our commemoration of the Civil War and that period when we got to the early 50s when these windows were being contemplated. I'm going to stand, if I may, so I can see everyone. Can everyone hear me? All right, good. Uh, Ray, uh, has, he hasn't asked me to digest my entire 300-page book, so I'm not going to try. But uh, a little bit of background before the 1950s, because the, he mentioned, Ray mentioned the Dixiecrats 1948, which was a very important year in the history of the Confederate flag in particular. But um, let me just start with the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. There's an old adage that the losers, the winners rather, always write the history. But as I think as most of you know, in the American Civil War, a real exception to the rule, maybe unique in human history, or modern history anyway, that the losers in the American Civil War had quite the role in shaping our understanding of the history. Uh, after a brief period in which it was very clearly not a good idea to go trotting out the symbols of the Confederacy, uh, during Reconstruction. After that very brief period, the White South was more or less allowed by the federal government uh, to erect statues to their dead first in cemeteries, monuments to their dead, to their soldiers, to their heroes on first in funereal spaces and later in public spaces to teach, to write histories, to teach history of the Confederacy and of the war from a Southern perspective, a, a, a type of history that became very influential nationwide, witness gone with the wind and birth of a nation for that matter. It influenced the shaping of the history of the American Civil War. So for this long period, really from the 1880s beyond World War One, I mean, the, the, the Confederate monument in um, Arlington Cemetery is erected in 1914, for example, and the last monument in Richmond on Monument Avenue in 1929. So this extended well into the, uh, the 20th century, the last major Confederate reunion in Richmond in 1932. And as Ray mentioned, the last veteran, actually the last bona fide veteran, died in 1949. All the while, uh, in that long period, the Confederate battle flag was part of the ritual of white Southern life in Memorial Day ceremonies in the rituals of the Confederate memorial organizations, in, the, in these dedications of these monuments. So it was a familiar part of the ritual of white Southern life, but it was restricted very much to those kinds of rituals, the kinds of things that many of us grew up with since the 1950s, a world in which every business that had Dixie in its name almost certainly had a Confederate flag as part of its logo. That was completely foreign before World War II. It started to change in the period just before World War II as the flag took on a meaning as a logo for the South, and I think we can agree more specifically the White South. Uh, it, it meant not just the Confederate Army, the Confederate States of America, but the South, White South, and American servicemen from the South fighting overseas, American uh, uh, Southern boys and their football teams when they were going to, to fight the Northern football teams, uh, adopted the flag as their symbol, a, a totem, if you will, of what it was to be a Southerner. And it was through that instrument, and in the period roughly 1948, uh, and just before, it, it, it did start before 1948, the flag started to have a more uh, prominent currency on the Southern landscape. A lot more people were using it. And a lot of people noticed it and were against it 
including the United Daughters of the Confederacy, who believed that it was not necessarily good for the flag to be used outside of a strictly memorial context. 1948, the Dixiecrats themselves did not adopt the symbol, but their young supporters, most of them from college campuses already accustomed to using the flag in a casual way, uh, associated the flag with the Dixiecrat movement, which of course began to protest the Democratic Party's embrace of a stronger civil rights platform in 1948. So it took on a meaning of protest against incipient civil rights movement as well as continuing to be all these other things. But in the aftermath of that, what the headline writers all over the nation dubbed the flag fad broke out. The flag became very popular in the North, and a lot of people were asking why. Was this somehow part of the Dixiecrat movement against Truman, or was it simply like the, uh, the coonskin caps and the hula hoops and the other youth-driven fads of the late 40s and 50s? Most people, aside from the African-American press, concluded the latter. It's just a fad. Uh, the African-American press were warning against the flag as a symbol not only of racism, but also of disunion in the context of the Cold War. We need to present a united front, and this flag suggested a disunity in the nation. So that was the context in the early 50s, was this, this interesting period uh, in which the flag w went from a very restricted symbol revered by its owners. The Confederate heritage groups essentially owned it, symbolically and otherwise. And it, and it was essentially Pandora's box open. For those of us who grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, the culture that we knew as children began in the late 40s, and particularly early 1950s, with the, with the flag fad. And interestingly, the United Daughters, Kappa Alpha Fraternity, and other groups fought very much against this. And they persuaded many state legislatures to pass laws that punished the very things that many of us knew growing up, uh, the beach towels with the Confederate flags on it. Uh, were punished by law as desecration of a sacred symbol, of misuse of the battle flag. So it wasn't the only, only the African American press, but the protectors of the flag, the keepers of the Confederate flame, initially reacted against it, trying to make sure that it was used only as a revered memorial symbol and not the way it clearly became by the time of the Civil War centennial. So that's really the context of, of, of the early 1950s for the use of the flag. Dr. Brown Douglas, um, would we install a set of windows like that today? If we did, how would it be different? Yeah. What an easy question. <laughs> As I contemplate that question, <laughs> I ask a prior question, first of all, and that is, would we have even installed those windows, let's say, in 1954 or beyond? Because, of course, they were installed in 1953. And in 1954, in response to the Brown versus the Board of Education decision, Confederate symbols began to gather new meaning or different meanings, as even uh, Dr. Kosky uh, points out in his book. And those meanings began to Become, it became very clear that these symbols were symbols of white supremacy or at least segregationist uh, symbols and symbols that stood against the decision of Brown uh, versus the Board of Education and stood against integration. And so I often think to myself, my, 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 the cathedral got in right under the gun uh, in installing those windows in 1953 because the culture certainly changed in 54. Today, I think that perhaps a series of questions would have to be asked that maybe weren't asked in 1953 when those windows were installed. And uh, the overall question is this, what does it mean to be the National Cathedral? We'd have to ask the question, who are we? Uh, are we more driven? by the nation's civil religion and its sense of itself? Or are we more compelled by who we are as a church and the theology of a church whose God liberated the slaves from Egyptian bondage and whose God 
we claim is most manifest in Jesus who said, I've come to set the captives free. And so I think that we would find ourselves today having to ask the question of what does it mean for us to be Washington National Cathedral? Does it mean that we happen to be a, we're a social institution that happens to be religious, and so we service the civil religion of the nation? Or are we indeed a church uh, which is called to show forth a glimpse of God in the world? And perhaps these were questions that weren't asked, I don't know, in 1953. But to be, sh to be sure, it seems as though the Lee Jackson Wendells at least forces us to call the question in terms of the civil religion that those windows represent. And it's the civil religion of the Confederacy as even the daughters of uh, the United Daughters of the Confederacy uh, spoke of this civil religion that in many respects uh, sanctions or sanctifies the Confederacy and raises Lee and Jackson as not simply heroes of the uh, Confederate uh, war, but that they are also saints. And so we would have to ask those questions, which would cause us to really contemplate and ask the wider question of what it means for us to be a national cathedral. Dr. Alice Nostokoski was very careful to point out that um, when he talks of the South and talks of a logo for the South, he's speaking particularly of the white South. And in his book, he acknowledges time and again that black Americans simply were not asked. They had no voice in that conversation as we came up with consensus symbols. Yet black Americans were speaking. Not being heard is different from not having anything to say. Let's talk about those years from the mid 40s to the mid 50s. What was going on in black America and was there a very conscious sense that um, this alternative narrative of the past was gaining legitimacy and gaining force and sort of hardening as, in the public consensus without a black American counter-narrative being given enough space. If you, <clears throat> if you go back to World War I, and the experience of black soldiers when they fought um, in France uh, under uh, French commands. And you look at the experience of most of them uh, being one where they uh, ate in the same restaurants as the French. They rode on the same buses and the same transportation, they fought in the same units, they trained in the same units. They were treated differently than they remember um, in uh, the America of that time. They fought in the war and then they return home with this new training, with this new expectation that if this happened in France and if I was allowed to feel differently and to feel more like a, a man, to feel more uh, empowered, to feel like I was equal to a white man, then this is something that's possible in America. So they come back to America and it was the summer of 1919. They call it the Red Summer of 1919 because of the number of riots that took place during that period. They come back to a continuing uh, environment of lynching uh, that started back in the 1890s but was still going on. They come back to a reminder that the equality that they felt and they experienced in France, they would have to leave in France or they would have to fight even harder for that environment to exist in America. And so Adam Clayton Powell and others coined the phrase, the new Negro. And that new Negro began to create 
uh, all kinds of agencies and all kinds of organizations that in some way supported this idea of equality within the community. But even as the NAACP and the Urban League and the National Council of Women and all of these other organizations began to exist, there also was the, the necessity of Ida B. Wells Barnett, who was in Memphis and who was, what was trying to in some way uh, uh, speak out uh, about injustices that were going on in Tennessee. She had to leave because they burned down her house. She had to leave and go to North. Somewhere around six million African Americans left the South and headed to the North, to the urban cities of the North, using the Chicago Defender and Robert Abbott's paper to give them information about where they might settle in Philadelphia, where they might settle uh, in, in New York, where they might settle in Boston. They left the South because for them, this confederacy that we discuss and that we talk about, this confederacy w was not for them um, a cultural icon that was positive. It, it equaled lynching. I'm trying my best to, to be objective about what we're discussing and talking about, but I, I, I just remember all of this pain when you talk about pride. I, I just remember all of this violence when you talk about liberty and justice. I, I, I just remember all of, of these. I had a young uh, white boy. I lived in Williamsburg, Virginia. And Williamsburg was, uh, 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 they called it the restoration at that point. And everybody came to Williamsburg to see uh, the town that Rockefeller built. Um, and I, I lived there and we lived on the east side of the town and right across the road from me was a, a, a white community. Uh, we didn't have to have a, a wall up. We knew that we stayed on one side and the white community stayed on the other side. But one day, one day I'm riding my bike down this road that was an yeah, uh, uh, integrated road that we never used. The whites drove on the road and blacks drove on the road as well. But I was riding my bike on the road. I had gotten myself a balloon and I had blew the balloon up and I tied the balloon on the back of my wheel. You know what I'm talking about. And so that when I went down the road, I <laughs> and I could swear that I was on a motorcycle. And so I was doing it and there was this white young man, same age as me, and there he was on his bike with us balloon as well. And so I rode and he rode and, and he was trying to go faster than me so that it would go and he did the same thing. And when we got to the end of the road, he looked at me and I looked at him. He was just as curious about me as I was about him. And then he spoke to me and I spoke to him. And all of a sudden he asked me a question and I asked him a question. We wrote a little bit more, and before I knew it, we had been talking together for three, four hours that all that afternoon. He was the only one I had to play with, and I was the only one he had to play with, so we played together. At the end of the day, he goes to his home on the other side of the street, and I go to my home on my side of the street. The end of the week, never saw him anymore, but the end of the week, we, all our families would go to the local riches, riches market to, to, to buy groceries. And we're in our car. I'm, I'm my, I sat in the middle. My, my, my brother sat on the right. My sister sat on the left. They were older than me. And I sat in the middle. And so I'm driving down the road and I look over and there's a car over in the left lane. And I look over in that car and there he is. There's that white boy that I played with. And so we get to the red light. And when we get to the red light, I've turned in my car and I'm, I'm looking at him and I'm look, hoping that he looks at me because he was on the edge. He was on the, he was in the back seat, but he was on the edge, not in the middle like I was. And as, I'm, as, as we're going to the stop, I said, well, when we get to the stoplight, I'll, I'll wave at him and he'll wave at me. So my family will know I have a white friend.
we get to the stoplight and he swerves over and he looks at me and when he looks at me he does this as I tried to wave at him he tried to avoid the fact that he even recognized me that is what I remember about the Confederacy that's what I remember about that flag because I found out that his father ran a barber shop and the barber shop ran a flag that was a Confederate flag and he did not want his family to know that he had a found someone who might be his friend and we never became friends we never saw each other after that day we never spoke after that day and I and I think often about what would have happened if he and I had not embraced a symbol and a lifestyle and a philosophy that prevented us from ever knowing each other before we ever gave ourselves a chance. You mentioned the Defender, which circulated on the rail lines throughout the country and told the story and kept the running tally of the number of lynchings, very important institution uh, in American life for, for black Americans. Was there an ongoing attempt to defang the Civil War, to make it less creepy, less scary, to make the sectional consciousness of the country that prevailed uh, less frightening to all Americans out of commercial interest as, as much as anything else. When I look at something like Disney's Song of the South and, and Uncle Remus, when I look at um, things like uh, the, the Ole Miss mascot running out onto the field with an enormous flag dressed up as a, uh, as a Confederate cavalry officer and the running rebels uh, and, and the Old South balls on various uh, state land-grant university campuses. Uh, there was a nostalgia about the antebellum world that declawed it. It wasn't based on um, chattel slavery and suffering and, and all that. It was based on glorified, received notions of what that world was like into which black people had no input. There was no yeah, but moment where you could add that other stuff to the story. Was there, John Kosky, an attempt to legitimize that story by making it less threatening, less cruel, less problematic for Americans from all parts of the country? And are these windows part of that project? Well, yes, on, on several levels, the, the popular culture level that you're talking about, rebels and Yankees becoming sort of like cowboys and Indians and that uh, that way but uh, on a more significant intellectual level in the half century after the war many of you I'm sure are familiar with David Blight's book Race and Reunion uh, in which he tracks the the memory of the war it's subtitled the memory of the Civil War 1865 to 1915 essentially uh, beginning really before the turn of the 20th century but especially in the years right afterwards the Spanish-American War agreeing to disagree uh, other historians Kerry Janney in particular in her book on remembering the Civil War makes clear that there was still a lot of dissension but in a sense southerners and northerners those who fought the war are still very much alive in that period and their progeny to the current day uh, agreeing to disagree on causes to uh, uh, praise each other's uh, valor on the battlefield we may not agree about what the war was about in fact they fought at the drop of a hat if the question of why the war came about were, were brought up in these reunions among veterans at Gettysburg in 1913 and again in 1938 but just avoid talking about the causes and talk instead about the war itself and about the, the valor of both sides. It was a kind of consensus 
among, again, white Americans to shove the causes to the side, to essentially forget the, what David calls the emancipationist vision of the Civil War, that actually something very important, emancipation of four million people, came out of this war. It wasn't completely forgotten by any means. Any generalization I make is going to be an exaggeration to some extent. But uh, America reunited on the basis of admiring each other's uh, valor on the battlefield during the American Civil War. And that continued into the period that we're talking about, especially in a World War II Cold War context. It was all the more essential to, uh, to talk about how the war made us stronger, made us one nation, and that we could not face the threat of the uh, of the Soviet Union and Red China if we were divided, but thank goodness we are now one people made stronger in this crucible that was the Civil War. Many people did remember emancipation. I mean, it didn't take a, a W.E.B. Du Bois to, to, to write about it. A lot of people did remember it, but speaking generally, the nation healed at the expense of racial justice. And mentioning World War I, Dr. Ellis married World War, mentioned World War I, reading something the other day from a, a, a Confederate veteran who had been one of the red shirts, one of the militia companies in uh, South Carolina immediately after the war. But he wrote a little pamphlet after, the, after World War I saying how it was that the South was responsible for victory in France. His thesis was by precipitating secession in civil war, painful as it was for those of us who fought it, and he was a colonel of a regiment, um, it was all for the better because it made this nation one. It exploded the doctrine of states' rights and made sure that this nation were unified. And if it hadn't been so unified as a result of fighting and for the Confederacy, losing the civil war, then it would not have been prepared to rescue the world in 1918. It was kind of an interesting thesis. But that's the sort of thing that was prevalent for most of the early 20th century was we are a stronger nation and as much as we may disapprove of, of slavery in your case or, or invasion in your, well, you invaded us and in, in, according to the Confederate charge, the southern charge against the north, we were guilty, we were uh, victims of your invasion, but we'll overlook that. And you people down south were guilty of of human slavery, but we'll forget that and admire what you did on the battlefield. It was, that was the, the basis of reunification, and it came at the expense of racial uh, justice well until the 20th century. Yeah. I guess what I would say in response to that and in response to what you're saying that clearly the nation, it was a pseudo healing. And clearly the nation had not healed and had not united. We can see that today. And so we can only suggest that the nation was united or the nation was healed from the perspective of white America, right? And so certainly not from the perspective of those who were enslaved and the perspective of black America. And the legacy of that continues today as we see, and which brings us to this moment of a nation not united, because the nation has not uh, been honest and looked at and talked about slavery or, the, or its legacy, of which these Confederate symbols uh, are a part. And there's much to say about that. I also think when we talk about, and even as I think about the question of what the church would do today, we also have to remember that there was a church that was speaking out against uh, these Confederate symbols, just as the African-American community has been ignored in some of the history about the uh, Confederacy of the Confederate symbols, so is the black church. And the black church was always a firm witness against racial injustice and against, obviously, as it emerged uh, as an invisible institution during uh, the time of slavery. And so that when we ask what the church would say, or even if we look at the ease by which some churches incorporated Confederate symbols within their institutions, well, you had the black church that was very clear about that. 
and it was very clear in terms of what it meant to be Christian and the black church continuing to hold up the theology of a God that was a liberator of the oppressed, a God who stood for justice and so that it was the black church who gave birth to people like Harriet Tubman, to Nat Turner, to Gabriel Prosser, to Denmark Vesey, to David Walker, to Ida B. Wells. Uh, and so you did have at the same time that you had this uh, a cathedral and you had perhaps a wider white faith community that was embracing Confederate symbols and embracing uh, the lost cause ideology, you had another Christian witness, which was the black church witness that was indeed saying that to embrace that is to compromise the faith. But it could not come into public spaces and cast a vote, a decisive vote, on whether or not Stonewall Jackson would be depicted as a crusading knight with trumpets, a literal trumpets pointing down from heaven as he looks skyward. They couldn't be heard. They were there, they were witnessing, That's right. but they couldn't be heard in a way that would um, change the debate, e e even if we enter on a debate. It is this divisiveness, I think, that is the legacy in many ways of the Confederacy uh, and the flag. I, I think about uh, World War uh, I and W.E.B. Du Bois uh, sort of advertising and, and, and sort of advocating for blacks to fight in the war. I, I think about Frederick Douglass and that same notion about blacks uh, fighting in the Civil War. Uh, it all, it, whether it was the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II, whether it was the United States Colored Troops in World War, uh, uh, World War II, whether it was the, uh, uh, the, 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 the 93rd or the 92nd Regiment uh, in World War I, whether it was uh, the Colored Troops in the Civil War, it was this, give me an opportunity to prove to you that I deserve to be a citizen. Give me this opportunity to fight and to die so that I might in some way convince you that I am not a coward, that I am worthy, that I am not what that symbol says, that I am not what that symbol purports me to be. I'm something different. 1915, there were ex-Civil War black soldiers who said, we need a building. We need something that reminds, uh, uh, that reminds the nation what we have done, that we have fought, and that we have died, and that we have been a, not just a part of this country, but we've given everything to this country. We have, we have fought valiantly. They, they, they held that dream until September 24th, when we opened that museum. We opened that museum because of a dream that began in 1915 that was deferred, 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 and finally came to fruition. Much of that need, that desire to want to be a part of America and wanting to be a part of the memory of what made America great was a dream that was deferred and for me, that has a great deal to do with the power, the prominence, and the presence of the Confederacy. And until we are able to begin to do what we're doing now, discuss and talk about it, and begin to heal as a result of it, it will maintain itself. I worry so much about what's happening in our country and in our nation now. Just the, the, the mean-spiritedness uh, that is here. I worry about it because that's not what we need. What we need is, a, is another kind of formula. Now, if you could, if you could convince me that there was a, 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 a definition or a new redefinition of the Confederacy and the Confederate flag that led us to a better understanding and a better, a better realization
of, of what we are and what we can be as Americans, I'd fly the flag too. Well, I think, I think context is pretty important in these, in these matters. When you want to fly a flag in your front lawn, and it's your front lawn, well, that's up to you, isn't it? Is it different if it's a state park in the state of Mississippi named for a general or a leader of a, of a, a state government that was uh, avowedly segregationist? Is it different if it's a Calhoun Hall at a university named after John C. Calhoun? Is it different if it's a church? Uh, and is it even more different when it's a church that in its founding documents says that it's a church for all people and for national purposes? Does, is it obliged somehow to present a consensus version of American history in a way that just any old church maybe isn't? Well, and is it different when it's in a stained glass window? Right? Well, and why, why is that? Why is that? <laughs> and so, and I think there are two things, and this brings us back to this question of sort of who we are uh, as, as the nation's cathedral, and what story, whose stories are we trying to tell, and whose stories are here in this cathedral. And so, let's say that a part of who we are, because there's a lot of iconography in this cathedral that is that's not in stained glass windows, but in uh, other monuments in this cathedral, a part of who we are is about perhaps telling the nation's story. And if that is the case, then we have to tell a broader story. And so that we have to tell the nation's story, which means that the story of not just people like Lee and Jackson have to be told, but the people uh, who were victims of the institution that they fought to preserve also has to be told. So a broader story has to be told. Now when we talk about stained glass windows, stained glass windows, the history of stained glass windows in churches, first of all, they entered into churches in one respect because they provided during the medieval period, they provided an opportunity for people who couldn't afford Bibles or people who were not literate to know the biblical story. And so in many respects, the stained glass windows are religious symbols. And as religious symbols, they say something not only about the culture out of which they emerge, but they are also saying something about the God to whom they point. And so what are we saying about God in the stained glass windows that are reflections of Lee and Jackson? And so that's a different question. It's different if they were uh, one of the monuments as is Lincoln, uh, et cetera, but they're stained glass windows. And so that takes on a different religious symbolism. So to you, they speak in a different way from a statue or oh, a yes. banner or some other, uh, a bar relief or some other form of acknowledgement. Stained glass window is and, a different In a way. church, and, and it'd church. be different if they were uh, in a museum, but they're in a church and they're stained glass windows. Is part of this problem, John Kosky, that um, once something's installed, getting it, the fight around getting it uninstalled, as we're seeing in New Orleans, as we've seen repeatedly in Richmond, as we saw at the Confederate State House, is totally different from the argument over whether to install it or not in the first place. Yes, it is. I also want to speak to a point that all of you were making about the, the context for these windows in 1953, precisely because this was to be the, the nation's church. And you say, uh, uh, observing that it was to incorporate all Americans, I think, I don't, I haven't read all the documents, but some relating to the history of these windows. That explains why they're here. And your point about a year later when the Confederate flag was being used in, in, in a year later in the decade after that, used very clearly and very more widely as a symbol of opposition and violent opposition, defense of segregation, opposition to integration, that might have made it less palatable for the cathedral after 1954 is a really good point. But um, what it tells us is that the white South was still in 1953, as it had been, I can tell you for the previous 50 years, since really the Spanish-American War, 
fighting for legitimacy, trying to prove to the nation as a whole its patriotism. Yes, we were on the other side of the Civil War, but we are all Americans now. And the White South tried mightily during the World War I period, just as African Americans were trying to earn, just as uh, Dr. Du Bois urged black Americans to close ranks with the nation and fight, despite what was happening to them at home. Uh, it's an opportunity to earn your, your respect. Well, the White South was also fighting for that respect. And a window here for the consensus hero of the Confederacy, the, the man who embodied virtues so much so that American submarines were named for him, they, army bases were named for him. A consensus, uh, a man at the time, and in 1907 at the time of Lee's centennial birthday, all kinds of famous northerners were giving uh, uh, speeches about what a great man he was at his centennial. So to, to have him represented here, and, and a lot of people wanted Lee and others represented in the New York University Hall of Fame. It was important to get respect, for the White South to get respect, uh, this many years after the war. I think that has a lot to do with why they're here. Precisely for that reason, to, because it was a nation's church and it was an opportunity of kind of a gesture of respect to earn our place at the table for the United Daughters of the Confederacy and prove once and for all that we are part of the reunited nation, especially in this Cold War context of what was threatening the nation. But to your point about taking things down, that is clearly where we are now. We have a commemorative landscape that has been built up over centuries, a commemorative landscape that one part of it, at least, testifies to the power relationships. I mean, a, a monument to a Confederate on a public space says, among other things, that at the time this monument was erected, the voice of black people didn't count. That's part of its backstory. Inevitably, there's no way around it. Uh, there are other reasons why it may have been put there, but it, it speaks to the power, the unequal power relationships at the time. But they take on a life of their own over time. People get used to them. Uh, you mentioned Richmond and Monument Avenue. It's part of the marketing of the city. It's one of the most visited places in the city. It's good for business. It's not about gray and blue. It's about green. Uh, it's, it's good for the city's image because people come to see it. It's good for tourist dollars. But people also get used to it. It's just part of what they grew up with. It's, uh, I was mentioning earlier when you were talking privately about high schools that were named for Confederate heroes in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. And people become invested in those school names, not because of the names, but because of their own personal heritage in attending that school and, and remembering from their, their dewy youth and the glory years. Uh, of being part of that school. So taking things down is, is, a, is, an, is an attack on, on, a, on a received world. Most of us do not stop and think that the commemorative landscape we inherit had to come from somewhere. Those things just didn't grow out of the ground. They weren't, God didn't place them there. They conscious decisions to place those monuments, to raise the money, to build them, to design them exactly as they are, to, to, to write those inscriptions that Ray read earlier. Those were all conscious acts, and there's backstories to them that speak to who had power and who didn't. They tell us more about the people who erected them than they do about the historical subjects that are being commemorated. They, they, they're documents of the period in which they were erected. Most people don't stop to think that. They just we, they, we receive this commemorative landscape as a given, and, and there's something, there's a human tendency to react negatively when you're comfortable, when you are comfortable, and as you were saying earlier, there's a lot of people who have very good reason not to be comfortable with that landscape because they do know the backstories. But when you are comfortable with it, an attack on it is a personal attack. It's a disruption of the life that you knew and, and, and the world as you received it. That's, I think, what you're getting. We're going to be going to your questions in just a moment. Before we do, I want to ask you, Dr. Ellis, given the point that Dr. Kosky just made about how these become fixed values, they are physical things. Stone Mountain is Stone Mountain. Uh, and it's very hard to unstone mountain it. Those windows are part of this building. That plaque commemorating Robert E. Lee that says that he was beyond reproach is a part of this building. Can you unbuild that? Should you unbuild that? I think if we 
I, I think your question was, can we unbuild the, the concrete and the image and the symbols that we have created? Um, yeah, we can. Uh, it takes a great deal of, of effort uh, to do that. Uh, the easier thing to do is to let it stand and then create new uh, definitions for why it should stay there. Call it culture. Call it something else. Don't call it violence. Don't call it, don't, don't talk about what it does or has done uh, to a community. For me, what makes it even more important uh, that we not only grapple with this, but that we resolve this is because it will always be like a scab, a sore uh, that, that, that won't heal. And, and in God's house makes it even deeper in terms of its ability to heal or its ability to destroy. In God's house, the, the people that I knew as a child who were the bravest, who did not allow oppression to overcome them, who did not allow their anger to subsume them, were men of God and women of God. And so God's house was always a sanctuary. God's house was always a place to go to renew one's self. God's house was a place to go to be inspired so that you can leave God's house and fight the good fight. To have in God's house something that questions your sense of what you can do, what you can be, what you can achieve, is to me anathema yeah. to who God is and to his example. I, I affirm that and just wanted to add that if taking them down is an attack upon a people, we also have to recognize that keeping up certain symbols is also an attack upon a people. Is, Dr. Kosky, is it different in a church, as we just heard Dr. Ellis suggest, from Fort A.P. Hill, um, from uh, a major square in New Orleans where a general stands. Uh, is, it, is a church a different place in a different context which demands a different kind of conversation and a different kind of response? I've written about uh, more about the difference between private and public as you were alluding to earlier and I'm not going to try to digest a whole chapter on that but clearly as you say there's a, a huge difference between what the NAACP referred to as a sovereignty context of state flags and uh, flags on public property uh, versus on private property, which, which really the, the laws of, of the customs of free speech uh, uh, rule churches. I, it seems to me it's a matter for the church itself, that is the people of the church. And I know that of any number of the churches, uh, primarily Episcopal ones to my knowledge, uh, that have wrestled with this issue but as someone who does not belong to a church, I will defer to those who do. And uh, is it different? Yes, clearly. Uh, and, I, and I think the decision belongs to the congregation, to the people of that church. Uh, let's go to questions and let me, let me ask you, and ask a question of the panelists. My name is Riley Temple and um, I am a former member of the Protestant Episcopal Cathedral Foundation here. Uh, the Board of Trustees, and I have spent a considerable amount of time studying uh, these windows and weighing in on it. Um, first, I want to salute the cathedral for doing this. This is a wonderful idea and a wonderful concept and an, an absolutely essential thing to do. Secondly, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, born and bred, and I grew up in a house that sat on the very ground of the largest Confederate hospital. A block away 
from where I lived, but it still exists, the soldiers, Confederate soldiers and sailors monument. Those Confederate symbols are never, were never benign. We always consider them to be an attack. They may have been benign with white people, but not in the black community. Um, secondly, with respect to Monument Avenue, I weighed in on Monument Avenue, a public thoroughfare. I don't believe those symbols should come down because they can be taught about. But in this church, my question is about framing the question. In a church that honors two people in windows, two people who fought to preserve the way of life of slavery, dehumanization, I think the question should be framed differently to talk about the burden of proof. And it seems to me that the burden of proof should be, how can you justify having those windows in a house of God? Not, how do we satisfy the burden of proof that they should come out? But how, you, how do you justify it? Responses, panel? No, I think, again, that that's the question, you know? It begs the hard question and questions that weren't asked when they were put in. And so we now have to begin, because we are at, hopefully, and we are, it seems to me by virtue of the fact that we're having this discussion, that we are at a different place and have new questions and different questions and are hearing, and should be hearing different voices, right? And recognizing that a history has been negated and that voices have been silenced. And so that if indeed this is a place for a church for all people, then those voices have to be heard. And so I, I think that the, the question is right and that's what we're grappling with. And I think that it requires these kind of discussions and uh, in which people can indeed began to hear the voices that have been left out of not simply the conversation, but out of the history and, and the stories that are not told in those windows. Dr. Kosky, does the fact that they were put in, that the cathedral uh, took the donation of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, um, that the inscriptions in the bays are worded the way that they're worded, signaled to us that in the Washington of 1953, this really wasn't even an argument. Very, very much so. I mean, that, that is one of the major points. I hope it's kind of come through the, the penumbra of our discussion so far, that in that period, this, it, it was, again, I, I mean, clearly among the African-American community nationwide and in the South, lots of reservations, lots of perceptions of them as attacks but among the white power brokers, those who were making the decisions, Lee was a hero. There was almost no question, as I say, uh, submarines named after him in this period, bases. It was just, you could go on and about the, the number of things, Lee and Jackson to a lesser degree, for one thing, he was a Presbyterian, uh, not, a, not an Episcopalian, um, but it, it is, at the very least, his the presence of those windows here put up in that year do testify to the zeitgeist of the time, that uh, they were among white America, heroes, a legacy of, of 75 years by that point, 80 years, four score and something, uh, years in which uh, the white South's interpretation of the Civil War had become a kind of consensus one. And also because, let's face it, the Confederates are more fun. They're the underdogs. I mean, this, is, uh, this has been a, an issue with reenactors, where you know, modern reenactments, as many of you know, 
you have to get some of the guys they show up as Confederates to galvanize and become Yankees so, they, so that the odds are at least fairly even instead of having 10 Confederates for every one Union soldier. It's, there's a romance about the Confederacy that began at the turn of the century that has helped as part of the, what you were talking about earlier, the defanging of the Civil War. And the, the 1950s is really right in the middle of all this. So it's, that, is, that is, let's say, the crucial context for this. Please. I think we had a good discussion. I'm impressed with the panel. And you really dealt with some issues. And as we go through this question period, hope we will raise more issues about the windows. We got the emancipation window, which is a very emasculating window uh, to look at and to excise and throw away. I've been picketing the cathedral for the last two months. Tell people who you are. Please. Robert Hunter, retired priest, Dr. Washington. And one of the security guards came out to check me out. He says, well, they moved the flags out of the windows, but I want to tell you, I know those folks. They ain't going to move them windows. I said, well, if they don't move them, that's OK, too. But I'm going to keep picketing, remove the windows. But I'm just 81, and I'm going to be picketing as the weather permits and the health permits. But that's going to be my witness. Now, the one gentleman came and said to me, I appreciate what you're doing. I'm trying to make a film about reconstruction, how we can reconstruct some healing in this nation. I said, you can't reconstruct this nation because it began wrong. You can construct this nation, build it anew. And that's what they say about a cathedral. It never is finished with construction. It's always being constructed. So being constructed, you will find stones that need to be thrown away. You will find windows that need to be put out. You'll find statuary that needs to be dismissed. Always we're constructing a new cathedral for a new age. So thank you. Now, Dr. Ellis just helped open a museum that has to speak to all the people about this highly fraught, highly contentious history of ours. How do you do that? Uh, I would like to I'd Mr. Like, I'd Mr. Like and to respond, respond to the uh, <coughs> gentleman, I'd, I'd sir. I'd like to respond to the gentleman um, in a way that's probably uh, surprising. Um, the uh, young man who was talking about Richmond and talking about the monuments in Richmond and talk, <laughs> talking about not wanting, did you get that young? Did you get that? Uh, and, and not wanting to take it down because there's a story to be told. I want to say a little bit more about that. Uh, the Confederacy and Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee are iconic uh, figures. We, about four years ago, uh, put together an exhibit uh, called The Paradox of Liberty, where we talked about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, but the title was Thomas Jefferson and the Slaves at Monticello because during his lifetime he owned over 700 slaves. We had Thomas Jefferson, a statue of him, and behind him we had the names because they did excellent research at Monticello and they know the names of all of the enslaved that he owned. So we put this huge series of tiles behind him uh, that had uh, though the names of those enslaved. Our suggestion was that in order for you to know who Thomas Jefferson was, you had to see him not just as a, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, an inventor, not just as a statesman, not just as an author, that he also was an owner of slaves. And in order to see him, you had to see him through that prism as well. I suggest that there are things that can be learned about Robert E. Lee and about Stonewall Jackson that we don't know because they have become iconic symbols of a value system as opposed to individual men who had parts of them that were good, that were bad, and were ugly. You, you started with 
the Memorial Boulevard in Richmond, does that mean augmenting that part of the church, adding material, adding something for the visitor to go on, or does it mean taking out that w those windows? I am suggesting that a conversation is valuable in terms of asking what do we really know about the iconic men as opposed to the human beings they represent. And I am simply saying that it's possible if we find out more about the good, the bad, and the ugly of who they were, it might not be necessary to take it down. It just might be expanding and enhancing a story that allows us to know more about who they were. And I want to add to that in a different way because even as we talk about those windows entering the cathedral in 1953, there's another story that we also aren't telling, and that's the story of the Episcopal Church and its complicity or not in the legacy of slavery. And so that in many respects, the fact that those windows so easily entered the cathedral in 1953 tells the story of the Episcopal Church at that time. Because it wasn't until 1958 at the General Convention, if I'm not mistaken, it was the 1958 General Convention, where the Episcopal Church spoke out for the first time about racial injustice. And so up to that point, of course, during the antebellum period, the Episcopal Church, while other churches were splitting over the issue of slavery, well, the Episcopal Church wasn't because the Episcopal Church wouldn't speak on it. And so the Episcopal Church was more concerned about unity at that time than it was about slavery. And, and in this sense, we weren't talking about racial justice, but about slavery. And so they were concerned about unity. And so in a sense, that same concern is expressed by the fact that those windows entered the cathedral in 1953 because there was that concern about unity and not racial justice. So when we tell the story, I think that the windows also signify the com complicated story of the Episcopal Church. And we need to be honest about that history and to confront those windows is also to confront that. But in that way, it may make it even harder uh, to get those windows out of there because people who in these latter days, and we just marked the 150th anniversary of the end of the war, seek validation uh, through the maintenance of symbols and the way symbols speak to us today. Uh, they may feel the loss more keenly from here than they would uh, a public park or uh, the courthouse square. Yes, ma'am. My name is Emily Teller, and I'm come, I've come here from Boston today to be here this week, and I'm thrilled to be here, and I think I'll have to come back for the next two years to represent the North, which I'm happy to do. <laughs> However, um, growing up, I was the only Yankee of 75 people in my family, and I went to Savannah, Georgia from Pittsburgh every summer of my life, and I was not allowed to sit on the back of the bus, much to my sadness. But I have a suggestion for going forward from tonight. I think it would be a huge mistake to erase history. I think that is a mistake that our country can't afford to make. And I would suggest that perhaps the stone of this building not limit the stained glass windows that are allowed to be here. And that going forward, a lot has happened since 1953. We had the Civil Rights Movement. We've had a complete increase in the number of um, Hispanic people who are now in this country. We have a Muslim presence in this country. And I think about the Norman Rockwell picture of the United Nations that shows all those different aspects of the world. And perhaps there could be a window or windows built to bring our national cathedral up to the current constituency that we have here with the history of all those different ribbons. I'm, I, I'm not in any way meaning to minimize African American pain over the Confederacy. I, I affirm that so much. But I think also that we need to have another presence. If we have a space window, we can certainly have Muslim representation. So you're here. saying keep the windows, but tell more a more complete story in the hang 21st up, century. Hang up more windows and shine spotlights okay. on them.
We'll move on. Yes. That gentleman right there had his hand up for a while. Yeah, we'll get to him. You're next. I think what I found more op more offending was the, were the plaques, were, were the words that were written on the plaques. And so to keep the windows, we would still have history. But to remove the plaques and to um, sort of incorporate I, what I think was doc were Dr. Brown's interests, that we show perhaps a evolving Episcopal Church, but we could keep the windows, but um, again, modify those plaques somewhat. I think it's the plaques that were. Should I read those plaque inscriptions again? No. No, okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is George Albert. For, for better or for worse, I'm not gonna talk about the windows. I live in Fairfax County. And for the last 18 months in Fairfax County, we've been wrestling with another Confederate saint, Jeb Stewart. I've been leading a coalition for the last 18 months of students, alumni, community members, organizations, including the NAACP, to change the name of Jeb Stewart High School. And I've been very impressed with this conversation. It's a conversation I wish we could have somehow in our community. Right now, most of our conversations are very div divisive, full of rancor, full of discord, full of refighting the Civil War, full of refighting massive resistance, full of refighting whatever fight anybody has with each other. Let me ask you something. Yeah. Earlier, Dr. Kosky said that in the case of some of these high schools across the South, when people go to the barricades to keep the name, it's not necessarily out of a particular love or reverence for in this case, Jeb Stewart himself, but because they went to and they graduated from Jeb Stewart High School, there's a mascot, there's a nickname for the team, and it's wrapped up in who they were and how they grew up as much as what an actual guy named Jeb Stewart did 150 years ago. Do you buy that? No, I don't buy it, but I understand it, okay? As, the, as the Revelation says, for me now, there's nothing new under the sun over the last 18 months. So that's a good argument that I've heard all the time. And in our, in our discussions and arguments, we've said, as you've all said, we have to find a way in this to preserve the history and the legacy of what's good about the school. But we should not be commemorating and celebrating Confederate values as they're, as they're remembered by Jeb Stewart as in the name of Jeb Stewart, just as your window type of thing. So I'm, I'm really looking for advice, counsel, help, advice, you know, how to get this kind of a conversation going. We, the school board, we finally got the school board to agree to move forward with a working group to consider over the next eight or nine months, if they ever start it, over the next eight or nine months to consider all these types of issues. But I fear that it'll become continue to be very discordant. We have some of our opponents taking the side of traditional, um, you know, lost cause history, if you will. Some taking, you know, other points of view of what the war was really about, what we felt it was really about. The school was named in 1959. Those of you who know the history of Fairfax County, Fairfax County slow rolled would be a kind word, desegregation never really presented a plan that was approved until about 1961. And so it was named in that context. So I'm looking for advice how we would, how we would, how we would get this kind of a discussion going on. I, I suggest to you that the conversations that you are having in Fairfax are very, very valuable. If this were easy to turn on a dime it would be done by now. This is the hardest thing that you will ever do to try to change hearts. The hardest thing. And, it's, and, and when I think of the fact that we now have a, a, a building that was, that was dreamed before I was even born and that it will, that it will stand until, but it took a hundred years for it to happen. Now, I hope it doesn't take a hundred years in Fairfax, but what I'm saying is that the seeds that you are creating now, I, I know it's frustrating, Eric, I can hear it in your voice, but my suggestion to you is to continue that fight 
and to continue the discussion and to continue to talk about it. The fact that it's difficult for me means that you are having the right conversation. How many times do we have conversations because we want everybody to feel good about what we're saying. We want you to feel good that you came and then at the end you've done nothing. So you are obviously doing something, you're fighting the good fight and you're fighting a hard fight. So the only advice that I have for you is use this as a way to motivate you to continue the fight. Passing history's gallstones, you might think of it as. Uh -huh. yes. How are you this evening? I'm a little bit different because I'm Jewish, okay? I'm also a self, first of all, I suffer from panic disorder, but my service animal's in my vehicle outside because I thought, since he's so close and usually I've been really good for the last six months because I lived in lower Manhattan in the early 90s for the first bombing, that I'd be okay, but I'm a, a little upset. And this is because I've gone to a lot of 150th anniversary battles and stood where Jackson marched on a 12-mile flank attack. And I've also done the march on Selma, the 50th anniversary when Obama spoke. And I was there, and I did it. I'm 47, and unfortunately, I wasn't alive during that, those battles. And I wasn't alive before the civil rights movement. But being Jewish, I happened to Dachau and Auschwitz. And I know what intolerance does. And it breaks my heart because Jackson and Lee, in my opinion, were men of God. They were men of God. And the way they held their battles and the way they stopped and, and the gentlemanly like of it, I cannot put myself, even as a woman, 150 years ago, because if I showed my ankle, you could be lynched, or, I mean, as a woman, as a woman, you know, the, uh, uh, the historical representation of women in that era, you follow me? We've come a long way. I want unity. My heart is sad because I want unity. It's a part in time in our history. I'm not happy about anybody being slaved, the Irish indentured servants, the Native Americans that were slaughtered in American history. It's all pathetic and sad. I want us to move on in 2016. Thank you for all that you're saying and I want an open, fair dialogue on our American history because I want us all to love each other because the Syrians, the Russians, they're looking at us, united we stand, divided we fall, and I want us to be together as one nation. My question is, are you happy with the way that the millennials or the younger generation are handling a lot of the racial crisis that has been perpetuated since Dylan and Roof and this whole thing that happened a year ago? Interesting question. Yes, they're calling the question, aren't they? I, I mean, you know, which, yes, and I'm not sure who, which millennials you're speaking of, but what I am happy about is that we're in this place, meaning not simply this place, but in this place in our history where the question has been called and hopefully we will lean into it. Uh, because if we don't, and you know, as I often say, and people have heard me say, there's a pit that divides us in this nation, and a racial pit. Now, there are several ways we can get around that pit. We can walk around it, we can jump over it. In theological terms, that's cheap grace. And we will find ourselves continually having that pit between us. Because we haven't done the hard, work of climbing down into it and all of the mess and the dirt where it's uncomfortable and we all get soiled but we tell the, the truths down there and we live in the truth and then and we deal with it as uncomfortable as it is and then we come back up the other side that's a just reconciliation not just reconciliation and so we're in this moment, and we have a decision to make. And that decision is whether or not we're going to tell the truth about who we are as a nation. And if we don't tell that truth, then we are going to continue to be in these moments of division. And so, yes, whatever, whomever these millennials are that you're talking about, I am glad that we're in this moment and now the question is to us what are we going to do about that 
uh, to end, I'll say this in theological terms, we call it a Kairos time. A time that is so pregnant with the presence of God and it's disruptive and it's chaotic. It, and it has to be disruptive and it has to be chaotic because God is trying to lead us into a new direction. And so taking, uh, destroy, tearing down things as they are, as they are so we can get somewhere else. So it is uncomfortable. And so, but it's our task as a church community to live into the Kairos. We can miss it or we can grasp it. Dr. Hosky, I'm glad our questioner brought up um, Dylan Roof because one of the more peculiar manifestations of this long-standing argument is that a mass murderer walks into a church, kills nine people, and somehow, circuitously, this ends with a solemn ceremony outside the South Carolina State House with an honor guard of state troopers in full dress uniform taking down the Confederate flag to be put in a nearby museum for which they're building a multi-million dollar additional wing to house this object like it's a piece of the true cross or a relic of, of you know, a, the head of a saint or the thigh bone of a, of a saint. And it's just a weird set of outcomes that begins with a heavily armed man walking into a church full of hate and killing a bunch of people and it's almost like throwing a boomerang. You end up with hitting some target that you maybe never even intended. What, what did you see going on with that? A lot going on, obviously, <laughs> just, just, just the way you phrased it. I mean, the Charleston murders galvanized opposition to the, the Confederate symbols that had, this is not new, Most, I think all of you know this has been going on for decades. That is, the, the undoing of the symbolic landscape uh, has been going on really since the, the t middle of the 20th century, that uh, removal of flags from public places, and there have been some peaks and valleys in that. And it had kind of reached a point of stasis after the change in the Georgia state flag in 2004, and the compromise that brought the flag down from the dome of South Carolina to the Confederate Soldiers Monument. But I think everyone realized it was just an armistice awaiting something, awaiting developments, evolution, if you will, of, of feeling in the country and uh, demographic change as well. All these things occurring. Uh, so the, the taking down is one part of what you're saying. Uh, and that I think that to some degree it, was, it, came, it came at a time when there was political movement to do that anyway. For one thing, it was an election year coming up and the Confederate flag has been a divisive issue in South Carolina politics for a long time. So it was an opportunity to get it off the political table before the 2016 election. The treatment of it in that reverential way, a piece of cloth that presumably was made in some place in America, maybe not, uh, that has nothing to do with the flags, the real flags carried by actual Confederate soldiers in battle uh, that or revered as pieces of the True Cross because of their association, but, but this is not one of them. This could be, right? right? I mean, they had to get their pound of flesh in order for that flag to come down. The people no. who wanted it to remain had to be made whole in some publicly perceived way in order for this to end well. I think it's called compromise. Uh, that the bringing down of that flag, which had been demanded and resisted, and of course, when you read the legislative history of what, how it, the compromise was reached in 2000, something very similar. Those who, who did not want the flag to come down at all, what they insisted on as a precondition for it coming down from the dome in, 19, in 2000 was that it be treated with respect, that the, a statement accompany it saying that this act does not in any way uh, reflect any dishonor upon the men who fought under this flag. That was one of the conditions that Senator McConnell and others who fought for it to remain on the State House uh, wanted, needed to accept. So it was simply what happened last year was an extension of this 30-some-year-old fight in South Carolina to reach the point where we are now. And uh, honoring the con those who fought for the Confederacy, the Confederate soldiers, and that heritage was part and parcel to any compromise, even in the wake of those murders in 2015. But your, your point about doing this with a piece of cloth that is maybe a year old, as if it were a holy relic, is, is, is spot on. It, it, is, it is odd, and, it's, and it underscores the difference between the actual flags, the, the relics of the war, versus the symbol, the representation with modern pieces of fabric. 
just as there's a dis fundamental distinction between public and private display, I think there should be a, a fundamental distinction between historical flags used by Confederate soldiers and just representations made in China in 2014. Dr. Ellis, does that example um, say, you know, is it a, is it a, um, a happy ending for some that's really tinged with dissatisfaction because the state is still unable to speak and say, this was not a great cause. This was to um, defend um, a breakaway white supremacist republic. This was uh, for purposes that we do not extol and revere in 2016. Is this need to strike a, f a balance something that, that leaves you still dissatisfied, even though coming down from the dome might be a good thing? It has to also come with some other goodies that come in the other direction in order to make it happen. It could be my evil twin. <laughs> but I think it's the old-fashioned bait and switch. I leave it here or I put it down here, but I put it back up over here. I don't lose a thing except geography. It's possible that it's my evil twin, but it's also possible that the change of heart that I was talking about earlier has not taken place. And the need for that symbol is greater than the need for healing. Yes, in the back there. Hi, I'm Kathy Ball. I'm an Episcopalian. I love the cathedral. It's a house of God, but it's a little bit uh, in attention with your panel in that it's like the great cathedrals of Europe filled with donor memorials tiny kneeling donors over here by the altar, stained glass windows to people's ancestors. Our history in the United States, in America, is a history of oppression from the very beginning. The oppression of native peoples, the oppression of enslaved peoples, the oppression of immigrants. If we erase every trace of that terrible history, what have we got left? Let's be like the Europeans. Just move on. Yes, in the back, in the way back, there's a hand. No, will you just what walk happened? right by? There we go. Hold up your hand. There we are. Stand up, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Joy Rutherford, and I am a member of the cathedral, a cradle Episcopalian. And I have a comment and a question. Um, it's uncomfortable for me to come into this space that is a sacred space, a place for me to come and pray and be at one with God when there is a representation of the injustice that has occurred to people, particularly black people. My question, Kelly, for you, why is it not enough the data that you've given in regards to stained glass windows and their origination? Why is that not enough to simply remove the Confederate flag and place it downstairs in the, in the crypt? Uh, for those of you who are, uh, are not fully up to speed with the, the state of play, the windows are there, but the Confederate flags that were part of the windows in both the Lee and Jackson memorializations have been removed and replaced with um, just colored glass. So there are, um, they simply just cease to exist in the window. Is that enough? Yeah, first, thank you for answering that. I think what's important is that we engage in these conversations. And I do think that that's important. There's a part of me very much 
that says that it would be easy, though it's obviously not very easy, but that it could be e would be easy to take the windows down and place them somewhere else, as in the case with the Confederate flag in South Carolina, and move on with business as usual, just as it would be easy to leave them up and do nothing. I think <coughs> the harder part is to engage in these kind of conversations and to confront the multiple meanings of those windows. And when I talk about the multiple meanings of those windows, I mean the things that we have talked about here. And to compel the community and who we are as a community to confront the complicity of the church, of the church in general, the cathedral community, et cetera, in the legacy of slavery. And then, decide, and then make determinations about what that means and what we're going to do. And I guess, for me, I just don't want to take the easy route out. And I really want to do the hard work of becoming a different kind of community and pointing a way uh, to how we can become that. Yes. Well, I actually, I actually have a question. Did you particularly mean to leave out the abject and rival brutality, the sexual abuse of African-Americans, the murder, the selling of children? Now, this is what these people fought for unequivocally. And Robert E. Lee and, 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 and his compatriot were traitors. Now, I haven't heard you mention any of these words and why that flag sits in the National Cathedral. You're, especially you, Doctor, you pointed out, but I. The other two, please, I'd like to hear your opinions off because I haven't heard you mention any of that. Thank you. No, I think I'm very clear on uh, all of that in which they stood for. And that's the story that I think's got to be told. And I think that that's the honesty and the truth of our history that has to be told. And no pun intended, or perhaps pun intended, and it can't be whitewashed. Uh, and I think that that brings us into real, as I said earlier, into real conflict. We've got to ask what we stand for and who we are. And if those are discordant with who we claim to be. This is, this is a core part of this ongoing argument, isn't it, Dr. Kosky? Well, whether the, of course, Lee and Jackson, I'm trying to, trying to answer this efficiently, uh, knowing we're short on time. Lee and Jackson certainly fought for loan their services to a nation that fought to preserve slavery, that its, its fundamental purpose for being was to protect slavery from perceived in, uh, interference by the Lincoln administration in the federal government. Uh, I'm sorry? They, uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh, so the, there, there is that inevitable stain of having fought for uh, when their, their services, their, their military uh, expertise fought very effectively, in fact, while they're celebrated as, as military heroes uh, for that very ignoble cause. To talk about the, to talk about the brutality and, and those two men, you need to separate them by a couple of degrees because they did not do it Personally, there were some accusations about Lee whipping his slaves, but did they fight for a nation in which that kind of thing happened? Most definitely. Uh, but it's, uh, I can see other people's backs getting up in, in the direct charges about these men being responsible uh, for that. And, I, and I, I don't think it's helpful to talk about Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson and brutality, because I can hear all these other people talking about how Jackson taught his slaves to read even though it broke the law and he was such, there's actually a book called Stonewall Jackson, the Black Man's Friend. So you will have, and, and you can read it for yourselves and find out whether, you find, whether or not you find it, whether or not you find it persuasive. But there is, a, there is this other, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, look, I, I lose my train of all that very easily these days, I'm, I'm losing my, my concentration, so I'm going to plow through and finish this answer, and then I'll be happy to entertain a question uh, on that. But uh, and wh whether or not they're traitors is still kind of open to debate. But I will accept that as a as I mean, they they did 
uh, violate their oath, their West Point oath. So it, it as, as, and Lee himself, if you read the work of Elizabeth Brown Pryor, the finest book on Lee, I think, called Reading the Man, you will uh, see new insights, very much like Dr. Douglas was talking about, things we can learn about Lee and slavery and African Americans and race, that she has unearthed things about Lee uh, and how he valued the fortunes of his own family. You know, the idea is that Lee was, according to those who revere him much, that Lee was, uh, did not like slavery. He professed not to like slavery because of its effect on the white men. And, but yet, Lee clearly wanted to preserve his own fortune and his family's fortune by keeping the slaves that his father-in-law freed in his will slaves as long as possible and even to get out of the terms of the will in order to continue to work those people because he did not want to impoverish his family. So men like Jackson and Lee at the very least and, and Jefferson and all those before them, regardless of the professions to hate slavery and whatever gestures they may have made to teach their slave, enslaved peoples to read, they were part of a system that clearly valued white fortunes over freedom and liberty for African Americans and property. And the fundamental problem of slavery really that people tend to overlook because we tend to think too much about the, the Django Unchained kind of brutality is that it treated people as property and allowed the separation of families that treating people as property was the most profoundly immoral part of slavery. There is a um, conversation that we had in the museum uh, back in 2008. Uh, Mamie Till Mobley uh, called the director of the museum and she said they are dis uh, disfiguring and disrespecting the, the casket of my son, uh, Emmett Till. And I, I would, would like for you to consider bringing it to the museum. Well, we had never, as curators, thought about uh, a casket uh, as an item that we would collect. Uh, but the more we talked about it and the more we considered it, the more we realized that it was an iconic object that was important, and the story about Emmett Till was important. For those of you who don't know Emmett Till's story, August of 1955, Emmett Till uh, was in Money, Mississippi. He was 14-year-old, he was from Chicago, but he uh, visited his relatives in Money, Mississippi. One day, he and his cousins went to a local store, and he was accused of whistling at the white woman who was the, uh, the clerk at the store. That night, uh, her husband and his brother went to the home where Emmett Till was sleeping, dragged him out of the house, took him uh, uh, away from the house with his cousin laying in the bed with, with his uncle downstairs sleeping, pulled him out, took him away, and they never saw Emmett again until his body was floating in the Tallahatchie River with a fan that was tied around his neck to weight him down, an industrial fan, so that his body would not come back up, but it floated back up. Emmett Till's mother was so destroyed by what they had done to her son, she said his, his, his face was unrecognizable. And, and, and looked brutal and horrible. And she said, I want the world to see what they did to my boy. And Jet Magazine displayed it. It was something that shocked the nation. Rosa Parks, uh, John Lewis, so many others said that that was the reason that they entered and went into the civil rights movement was because of that event we decided that it was important for us to tell that story. And even though we put signs up and let folk know that this is, this is, this is history at its most raw, uh, but we decided it needed to be a part of the story that we tell at the museum. That's what I mean by examining and talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. You have to see it all, Mr. Fairfax.
you have to argue with it all in order for some healing, some modicum of healing to take place. You, you cannot overlook the violence because that was a part of the story as well. And healing cannot take place until it's laid bare and the truth is there for all to see. And can I just diddle that and say that's what I mean when I talk about going down into the pit and that you've got to tell the truth and all the brutal facts of the truth. Ray, I think we've got one more insistent here. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, oh, you won't give it to me? No. Nope. You on think to I'm going to steal it? No, okay. I'm okay. Well, oh, okay, and I don't dare put my arm around you, but otherwise I'll get locked up for something, right? Uh, anyway, I did want to thank you all for this very interesting presentation. I have been involved with this wonderful cathedral for about 50 years. Uh, you see, I am now 87, older than you. <laughs> And I, I think we need to celebrate also, while we're talking about difficulties with racial injustice, we need to celebrate the fact that we have made significant progress racially in our nation and in this cathedral. In, the, in our nation, we have to have a black president who I voted for a couple of times. Uh, we haven't recognized that at all tonight, that great progress. Also in this cathedral, we had a black dean, Nathan Baxter, with whom I worked for decades. And so we have made some very good, substantial progress indeed. And so I think that while we have this window that offends some people, it's part of history and we can't just go around throwing away parts of history that we feel offends us somehow. If we did that, I would be very busy because there's a hell of a lot of history that offends me. Uh, I'm concerned that once we get through with this window that's been there for so long, the next person is going to go into War Memorial Chapel and take a look at the windows in War Memorial Chapel where we're blowing up people and blowing up tanks and battleships and everything else and say, oh my God, we can't have that kind of thing in a cathedral. So I believe that we have to give thanks for what we have and we have to accept the history of this place as we accept the history of our nation because this place represents the history of our nation. Thank you all very much for being here, though. It was a very interesting program. That gives, that gives us an excellent opportunity to get final thoughts from the panelists and say good night to you all. Respond to what you just heard, and we, you will take us out, the three of you, uh, with your response to what you just heard. I think that <coughs> the gentleman is right. We are not where we were 20 years ago. We're not where we were 30 years ago. Um, but there is still a great deal of work to do. I congratulate the, uh, the cathedral and all of those who planned this event. Uh, I hope this is not the last event. I hope that the conversation continues uh, because the work must continue uh, if we are to realize uh, the dream uh, that this young lady talked about when she said she wants us all uh, to get along and to be better uh, together. Uh, I think that we can do that, but it's going to take some work. So I congratulate you and all of you all who put this together. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to allow me to be a part of the conversation as well. Well, I can first I thank everyone for being a part of this conversation. And I echo Dr. Ellis's comments and my response is that we aren't where we were and we aren't where we're supposed to be. And so that I hope we continue this hard work together and that this is indeed the first of many conversations. And, uh, yes. and thank you all for inviting me. It's been a privilege to be part of this and to be
uh, on this stage uh, in this space. It's really a very profound experience and very profound things, that, particularly that my co-panelists uh, said tonight as well. The, um, my first love of history before uh, Civil War from my, my college days and before that, but studied mostly the turn of the 20th century, so steeped in Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, who are so much an integral part of this cathedral. And you talk about some complex history of those two men, those two presidents, and the difficulties that they present. Uh, we think of the Civil War as the only, as the mo messiest part of our history, the most conflictive and divisive part of our history. But you look closely at the presidencies and the men themselves of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, and they're also very difficult, very di potentially divisive chapters. You have opened some more cans of worms for you all to consider. But just to, to go to the, the gentleman's point about um, the, the difficulty of history and the messiness, these, these pits that we're talking about, it's all messy. And uh, the way to confront it, I believe, is not through debates, not through some sort of Jerry Springer show adversarial uh, panels, because all you get is argument, very much like the election that we're all enduring right now. The way to tackle it is through a collective discussion like this. We're all in it together, whether we like it or not. And we all are trying to figure out how we can live with ourselves and with our history. And the only way we're going to do that effectively is not through adversarial means, but all of us getting together and, con and realizing that we, we need to work together in the, for the sake of understanding. We're never going to agree. We simply need to understand as best we can. And we may agree to disagree on the fine points, but it's collective effort to understand our past, messy as it is, that is where is the profitable direction for all of us to go. Thanks for your excellent points and questions. And please thank Dr. Rex Ellis, Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, Dr. John Kosky. Thanks a lot. And uh, let me remind you, this uh, conversation will be posted and uh, streamable on the Cathedral website. And also C-SPAN was here tonight, so uh, watch C-SPAN, uh, find out when this is scheduled for broadcast, tell your friends. And we'll be having further discussions in this series. Uh, watch the Cathedral website to find out more about those as well. Thanks a lot. And we thank you, thank you. Grace Morris.